Hello everyone out there in YouTube land. It is Ann Lee, your everyday light worker. And also for this video, I'm going to be your equity expert, helping you to be realistic about how to get any kind of equity through the formal federal complaint process. So today we're going to start with the first step in that process. The formal complaint process is a very lengthy, complex, and litigious process, and it goes on for quite a while. I'm going to say at least six months, sometimes longer. Sometimes it can take years. So this is something that you should know if you're really committed to pursuing this formal complaint process for as long as you can. So today we're going to start with the very first step. And the very first step is very important because it sets up how the whole entire formal process is going to run. So remember that you have 15 days. When it's not resolved through the formal process, you have 15 days with your agency's EO office or the EOC to file a formal complaint after you have completed the informal process. So the formal complaint has to be in writing and contain specific information such as, and we talked about this with the informal process, you have to have the basis for the complaint, the description of the alleged discriminatory incidents. You have to have the harm that you have suffered, you believe that you suffered as a result of the discrimination. And the complaint also has to identify the individuals or entities responsible for the discrimination and the relief sought by the complainant. So it can be something um, as simple as, I want this bad actor to stop doing this thing to me. That can be relief. Or it can be, and usually it is something that I want a certain amount of money and damages for the harm that I have suffered. Now, once the formal complaint is filed, the agency or the EEOC is going to investigate the complaint and issue a decision. And that decision may include a filing of discriminate, a finding of discrimination or a finding of no discrimination. And if the complainant or the employee is dissatisfied with the decision, they can request a hearing before the EEOC um, and administrative lodgers with the EOC, or you can request that the case be reviewed by the EOC's Office of Federal Operations. I usually, um, well, I, when I'm representing complainants, I will say you should go, you should request a hearing before the EOC because that's going to be more fair. Or the what the EOC is so overwhelmed with the complaints of discrimination. When they can just rubber stamp and push a complaint through their processes, that's what they're going to do. And that's what I feel happens with the EOC's Office of Federal Operations. They don't ever find, um, you know, complaints of discrimination. you got to think about who is in this office and what are they reviewing. I, I don't, I have not seen them really review anything, but that's just me. My experience is very, very small in all of the experiences with the EOC's Office of Federal Operations. So we've begun talking about how the formal complaint process is lengthy and complex. So to that end, a lot of complainants are going to choose to hire an attorney to assist them. And you would be wise to do that because it's a very litigious and legal process. And you have to know at the very start how to set it up. So if the complaint for the formal process is not drafted, with all of the claims correctly articulated, and really only an EEO lawyer would know how to navigate this very legalistic and bureaucratic language. So at a minimum, a complainant should try to have a conversation with an EEO lawyer about, you know, what are my claims and how should I articulate them? Because if you don't articulate them correctly at this stage, which is a very important stage, you waive the claims. So that's why it's very important because you don't, it's like, this is your time to say what happened and what's wrong with it. What's wrong with it? Why you think it's discrimination in a very legalistic way. And if you don't say it at that time, you are, you have, you waive the claim. You, you can't say it later. 
you you just it's it's done and so the eo report is important in this process because of that the eo report gives you supposedly allegedly the basis for you to articulate your claims problem is things can happen after you file that initial informal complaint and retaliation is usually what happens and if the complainant doesn't understand that retaliation itself is a basis for a complaint they're not going to articulate it in their formal complaint and they're going to lose all rights to complain about that throughout the EEO investigative process, which is quite lengthy. So once the complaint is drafted, and usually the agency will provide you the complaint with a form that allows you to report all the information that is required, that complaint is going to be accepted by the agency with an acceptance letter. And it's very important that a complainant or a complainant's attorney review that agency's acceptance letter closely. And what the acceptance letter is going to say is, um, do you accept this letter? Are, have all your claims been articulated? You have a certain amount of days to say if they have not. And it is important that you review it and see if all of your claims have been articulated correctly, because if they haven't, you're, you're gonna, if you don't correct that, you're going to lose any right to complain about that throughout this long investigative process. So the report of investigation, which the agency conducts, and they hire an independent investigator to do this. So, an, so who gets hired is an independent investigator that, you know, has done these kind of investigations. The problem is that these investigations are structured in such a way that unless you really know how to navigate this process, it's just weird and your claims will be hidden unless you have articulated them properly so that the investigator has to really look at them and really has to ask the, whoever you're complaining about some really hard heading, hitting questions. So the agencies try to cheat the complainant out of having the real issues formally investigated by preparing an acceptance letter that does not list the issues that the complainant actually complained about. So it's very important for an employee to review or have an attorney review whatever acceptance letter the agency provides to the complainant. Whatever is not inside the complainant's acceptance letter is not gonna be investigated. So I've had this happen to many of my clients. Take, for example, this client that requested a reasonable accommodation for a disability. This particular federal agency, and it was a pretty large one, not only had no formal process for requesting a reasonable accommodation, which it should have, didn't have one, and so a lot of agencies just don't go through the work of creating any EEO processes. Once the complainant, um, requested a reasonable accommodation, she was targeted and many of the aspects, other aspects of her employment were tampered with. And many of the tools that she required to function at her job were tampered with. And this does happen to a lot of employees, federal employees. I'm just being honest with what I've seen over the course of my career. So for example, when the complainant requested leave for a doctor's appointment, it was denied. When she requested an update to her computer so she could complete her work, that was denied. This is retaliation, or at the very least, retaliation should be alleged in the formal complaint of discrimination. Whenever people file an EEO complaint, and that is not what this individual did. Initially, what they did was request an accommodation. But whenever, you know, this that 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 in and of itself is considered protected activity. And so when you get blowback for participating in what is called protected activity, act, and that means activity that has anything to do with the equal employment opportunity laws, which requesting accommodation does. It's it's an activity that, you know, I'm asking for something that has been promised to me under um these federal disability accommodation laws or the American with Disabilities Act. So, you know, I'm doing, or for the federal employees, this is the Rehabilitation Act. So I'm requesting this. 
it's been said in the Rehabilitation Act, I believe, of 1972, I'm entitled, and now I'm getting this retaliation. So this particular agency was not amenable to the request for accommodation. And so she began experiencing retaliation as soon as she requested the accommodation. So the complainant has two claims, really. She was complaining to the agency about failing to consider her request for an accommodation, which the agency did. And she was also complaining about the fact that she was retaliated against after she requested the accommodation. And she had several examples of how this retaliation was being experienced. Her request for leave was denied. She was unable to get her computer fixed so she could complete a work. She was removed from an email distribution list so she could get work assignments. And this is all very typical. These are the typical things that happen to federal employees who complain about discrimination. What a supervisor who hears about this complaint will do is try to make the employee very, very uncomfortable in their job in the hopes that they will quit. And sometimes they take away all of an individual's job duties in the hopes that they will quit. Sometimes they give the employees a greater number of job duties, again, in the hopes that they will quit. All of this is retaliation, and the employees need to ensure that they articulate this retaliation in their original complaint of discrimination. If the retaliation does not happen until the complaint files a formal complaint, then the formal complaint needs to be amended. And the formal complaint can be amended by contacting the EEO office in the um, agency that is responsible for accepting the complaint and preparing the acceptance letter. And this is usually done by an EEO counselor. I can't stress this enough. I cannot stress this enough. All correspondence to an agency's EEO office needs to be in writing. And please note that the agency's EEO office is different from the EEOC. They're not the same thing. The EEOC is like the federal agency that oversees this whole entire process. But every federal agency is supposed to have its own EEO office that tries to handle EEO issues for the agency. It doesn't mean that they do, and if they don't, you can go directly to the EEOC. But they should have somebody who's looking into EEO complaints for the agency. A lot of times these people are not properly trained and are not given any real incentive to do this job correctly, and they don't. So if you don't have any evidence that you, and so I say use email. Email is perfect because it provides you a time, date, stamp of when you did whatever you did. And if you're like, well, I talked to them over the phone. If you don't have it in writing, if you don't have evidence to request um, the shows that you requested to have additional claims added to your acceptance letter or that you submitted additional claims of retaliation after your complaint, is accepted, you are going to lose the right to raise these claims. It's all about evidence. You don't keep everything in writing. If you don't have emails, if you don't, or if you send a letter, you know, you need to um, have a copy and you need to have the postmark. You, you need evidence. If you don't have that, you know, or if you fax something, show that the fax was received. If you don't have that evidence, um, you know, it just, you didn't, it's, there's no proof that you raised a claim and it will not be um, added. It will be ignored. So the formal complaint process is a really long and technical and confusing process. It's very difficult for an employee to complete this process without some kind of legal assistance. Lawyers either know the process very well through trial and error. That's how I learned it or they know how to deal with EEO agencies who are reluctant to do anything. And quite honestly, there are a lot of agencies that are in that category. So to summarize, the first step of the formal process is filing your complaint within 15 days that you receive that formal right to file. You or your attorney will draft the complaint making sure that you check off all the boxes for every basis that you were discriminated upon. And as an attorney that has represented complainants, I've never seen an EO agency 
and EEO agency office correctly articulate all the complainant's claims. And I believe that is by design. From the outside looking in, what it looks like is that the entire federal EEO process is filled with all these little tricks and traps that ensure that a properly articulated federal EEO complaint never sees the light of day. And this all goes back to not being able to have real and honest dialogue around racism and to be fair, sexism as well. So I, I've done videos on that, how we, in this country, we don't have honest conversations around racism and sexism. And there are reasons for that because it's just dangerous. So when you bring a formal EEO complaint, if it should be on race or sex, it's that same kind of danger. And the federal employment discrimination process just puts up countless roadblocks to prevent an employee from even correctly bringing the complaint. Some of the roadblocks that it brings is that it's an incredibly lengthy, incredibly complex process that you have to engage in to bring the formal EEO complaint correctly. You should get a lawyer, but at an, at a minimum, you should have this information that I'm giving to you on YouTube for free to explain what the process is like, how many pitfalls they're all to the pro how many pitfalls you're going to encounter along the way, and think long and hard before you undertake this route. You have to start correctly. The first step in the correct articulation of the basis and the claims, well, that's the first step. You have to correctly articulate the basis and the claims. It's the very first step. Most EEO counselors at most federal agencies have no idea how to help you do that. And it's their job to do that. But they, most of them don't know how to do it. It is an incredibly legalistic process. And most of these people aren't lawyers. I would say that most of these professionals have been hired for the purpose of helping the agency quash as many of these complaints that they can, except for the most egregious ones. And even the most egregious ones, which they allow to matriculate through the process, are only going to receive a fraction of the restorative justice that they should receive. So many of these employees, unfortunately, have been threatened with life and limb by like supervisors that are just incredibly corrupt and incredibly power hungry and just want to make people miserable because they can. And so when they engage in the entire process of trying to prove this with or without a lawyer, because understand that lawyers aren't cheap. So a lot of people try to get through this process without a lawyer. If they have a lawyer, they're probably going to end up with just pennies on the dollar with regard to the hum humiliation they have suffered and endured. If they don't, they're, it's almost impossible for them to walk away with anything. I'm not saying that. It never happens, but I'm saying that it's, it's very difficult. If you are a federal employee who is absolutely certain that you want to pursue this route of a formal federal complaint, what is most important is receiving an acceptance letter at the very beginning of the process that correct, correctly articulates your claims. That's a very, very important. If you don't start correctly with that, you're done. Your EO complaint is just going to be pushed through with a finding of no discrimination to that infamous circular file. So remember this, when it comes to filing an EO complaint, what matters absolutely the most is being able to articulate the harm that you've suffered in legalistic language that is used in these very, very formal processes. If you do not have that, you don't have a fighting chance of bringing any attention to or getting any justice for what is usually a very valid EEO complaint. In the next video, I'm going to discuss the first stage of the investigation in these formal EEO complaints. And that begins with the investigator requesting or taking the complainant's affidavit for the report of investigation. The complainant usually is going to request greater detail or the affidavit, I'm sorry, it's going to request that the complainant go into greater detail about the claims that have been accepted and documented 
in the acceptance letter. Your goal is the same as with the acceptance letter. The complainant wants to articulate the harm he or she has suffered using the legalistic language that is used in these very, very formal process. And please keep in mind, this language is nothing like a typical conversation. It's nothing like that. It's not about you saying, I came to work and then this happened to me and that happened to me. The language is nothing like that. So it's different legalistic language. To even have a shot at bringing an effective EEO complaint at the formal level, you really should, at a minimum, take one of my online classes that I am in the process of creating on bringing a formal EEO complaint. I'm developing this class right now, and it's starting with these series of YouTube videos. But ultimately, I'm going to place these videos on my website and put and also put together this um, formal class that is going to have quizzes, it's going to have the PDFs of this information, and it's going to nav help you navigate the entire EEO process. I know this process quite well and have helped many a client navigating it. So, from having real authentic conversations about racism and sexism to bringing valid informal or, e or formal EEO complaints in the federal sector, the private sector, I can also provide you with guidance on that. I am your equity expert, and I'm here to help you have a conversation with yourself. I mean, that's where the conversation starts on why equity continues to be so elusive in this American experiment. And don't think just because you have a valid complaint and you bring attention to it that you're going to get any kind of justice. I'm sorry to inform you, it just doesn't work like that. But if you step back and you think about it and you're smart about it, you can find a way to get what you need. So peace, Ann Lee, your everyday light worker, helping you to pursue the equity that you deserve. Bye.